We'd like to welcome you today to our Safety and Health Magazine webcast, Are You Ready to Lead Safety Differently? And we are sponsored today by Aveta. My name is Barry Botino, and I'm an associate editor at Safety and Health Magazine. I'll be moderating today's event. Again, we apologize for the audio issues there. We'd like to thank you all for joining us for this webinar. And before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to share with all of our attendees. As a disclaimer, the views of today's speaker and organization are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorses those items. This is a pre recorded event, but we encourage you to ask questions, which will be forwarded along to our speaker today. If you have a question, just click the QA button at the bottom of the screen, type your question, and press the send button. After this presentation, you'll also be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, but I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. This webcast will be archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, please go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events, or you'll also receive a link in a post-event email. With that, let me go ahead and introduce our presenter. Pam Woloski is the Senior Program Director with Safety Technical Consultants Incorporated. Pam has 25 years of experience as a dedicated safety professional. She holds the CSP designation and is a nationally recognized speaker and author. Pam is the coordinator for the Occupational Safety and Health Management Systems section for the third edition of the Safety Professionals Handbook, which is scheduled for publication in early 2022. Her book, Risk and Crisis Communications, Methods and Messages was published in 2011. She also presents webinars on a wide variety of safety, safety topics and has been a featured guest on the Safety and Health Magazine on the Safe Side podcast. That's episode 16 for those of you who'd like to hear more of Pam's expertise. And we'll share a link to that podcast episode in our post event email for you all. Again, we thank you for all tuning into this presentation today. Our apologies for the audio issues. And now we'll let Pam take it away. On uh, that title uh, comes from some of the um, emerging approaches to occupational safety and health um, that we've seen coming out in the past couple of years. One of them is safety differently. You may be familiar with it. Uh, some of the other ones are called safety one and safety two, uh, human and organizational performance. Uh, there's been a lot out about psychological safety in the past years. Um, and for me, and, and a lot of this presentation is sort of about my journey uh, in the past four or five years, um, as I began to read more and more about these approaches and how they focused differently on the worker and on the role of the professional, I began to get really excited uh, in a way that I hadn't been excited for many years uh, in my career. Um, and I really, you know, wanted to begin to implement those procedures and processes in the way I did uh, the kind of work that I did. But over time, I began to appreciate that some of what those approaches were talking about um, not only required a different way for our organizations to function, but a different way for us to function as professionals. And I began to really think long and hard at the way I interacted uh, with workers and what I thought about workers in the organizations that I've dealt with and how I think about them and my attitude towards them and my behavior towards them. And I began to realize that I needed to make some changes, not just uh, helping organizations that I work with make changes, but that I had to make some changes. Um, and so I sort of took this introspective look at myself and I'm continuing to do that. And at the end of the day, I've uh, begun to do things differently, lead safety differently. And that's what I want to share with you today. But, but the theme of the presentation, um, I guess, could be summed up um, by saying, uh, maybe it's not them, maybe it's you. And what I mean by that is, if you're not seeing the kinds of outcomes in your organization um, that you would like, uh, if you're struggling with compliance, uh, if you if you are concerned about what happens when your back is turned and all of those things that we as professionals struggle with. Um, so maybe it's not the workers, maybe it's not the organization, maybe it's you. And, and I'm going to uh, suggest that maybe it is you, 
Um, and and the only way I think that we'll uh, improve or change is if we're willing to do a little bit of work on ourselves and maybe take a different view uh, of how we do things. And so first I'm gonna share with you some of the things that I think really have frustrated me the most the past couple of years. Um, and this is one of the first ones. I, I see this a lot. I, I'm pretty active on um, social media, primarily LinkedIn, um, on some professional Facebook groups and Twitter. Um, and I see these kinds of comments uh, fairly regularly. Um, and uh, it makes me cringe. You know, I, I think to myself, I've probably done that. I've probably called workers stupid or um, idiots, or maybe I've uh, commented on some of those shared photos or videos that we always see of workers getting hurt doing things. Um, and they, they tend to be uh, videos that show um, potentially serious injuries and people doing things that when we look at that video, our first response is to think, why would they do that? Um, and that really has um, been something that's really troubled me lately. And, and the way I think about this is, if you can't appreciate uh, that it's been probably not too long uh, since you did something stupid, um, then maybe your view of workers is part of the problem. Um, We've all done things that could have uh, resulted in a serious injury or uh, or in our own deaths, and we've survived. Um, and sometimes we just kind of like, you know, hit ourselves on the forehead and, and move on. Uh, but I think we have to appreciate that same behavior in ourselves as we do in the workers and probably rethink uh, what we say about that kind of behavior. Here's another one that's come to drive me crazy. Uh, they have no common sense. Workers have no common sense. Have you seen that? Have you seen people talk about that? Have you said that? Have you heard other people talk about that? You know, when you're sitting around at a conference or um, uh, perhaps a, a, a networking event of some sort and you're grousing about the struggles that you're having in your organization, you know, have you said to yourself, you know, the, the, they just don't have any common sense. I don't know how we can get them to do what they need to do. And I always think about this uh, quote from uh, Voltaire, which was actually a pen name of a gentleman who um, uh, was a French uh, uh, author and philosopher, and he wrote a lot during the Age of Enlightenment. Um, he's been dead since the late uh, 1700s, but, but this is so true. Um, we think about common sense. We think that there is this shared uh, view and experiences of the world that we all have and we sh all should behave in a certain way and doesn't necessarily um, work that way, right? I mean, if you look up common sense in the dictionary, Webster will tell you that it's sound and prudent judgment based upon a simple perception of the situation or facts. That seems pretty reasonable to me when I look at that and I think to myself, that a worker should have that sound and prudent judgment and perceive the situation and, and facts and behave in a certain way. And that makes sense to me, but, but your common sense is really the sum of your unique perspectives and your unique experiences. And so the idea that common sense is common, kind of what Voltaire was just saying, uh, it's not true. There is no such thing as common sense because everybody's sense of the world around them and how they have experienced the world and how they perceive the world is unique to them. And it's unique to them both in the lives that they live outside of our organizations, but it's also unique to them in the lives that they live inside of our organizations. And so when we think someone should behave in a way that is commonsensical to us, um, I think we have to sort of check that perspective and realize that those perspectives are different. There's another piece to this, you can't fix stupid and people have no common sense, that also has really begun to trouble me. And I'm gonna pause for about five seconds to give you a chance to read this quote so that I'm not talking over top of you. So Jim Loud is a friend of mine and he has a, a consulting organization and he writes a, a blog and um, he started a thread on LinkedIn in the middle of August about six weeks ago. Um, and it really, it really engendered a great discussion. 
but you know, his points about this sort of disdain or the lack of empathy from us as a professional, um, I agree. I see it with disturbing frequency. And maybe you do too, and maybe you participate in it. The message is that people don't have common sense and they don't care about whether or not they get hurt um, and why um, why that happens. But but I also hear frequently from my fellow safety professionals that um, they really are passionate about safety, that they really care about workers, that that they really are committed to making sure they go home at the end of the day uh, in the same way that they came in. But, but if that's true, then how can we continue to have this, what he calls a counterproductive view of workers as clueless liabilities? And I think that that dichotomy is something that really troubles me. And it's something that I really have had to have a, a lot of really sincere and deep thoughts about myself and how I've behaved and what I've said over the years and whether I've contributed to that. And if I have, you know, what do I have to do about that? The third one that I think is really challenging uh, is the idea of compliance and the struggle that we have uh, constantly with compliance. Um, and so when we have a procedure or a process and an employee uh, deliberately violates it, then our response is to pull out the procedure or to pull out that uh, gradual um, disciplinary action timeframe, you know, verbal warning, written warning, whatever, and really implement it. And, and that tends to be, I think, our first reaction uh, or tends to be the first reaction that we see when somebody uh, fails to comply in the way that we think they should comply. And I guess I always think to myself and have thought to myself for a while, if I accept that they were deliberately uh, lack of compliance, then for some respect, I have to maybe assume that they don't care what happens to them in their job. They don't care what happens to them or their coworkers. They don't care if somebody gets hurt. And I just can't square those two positions. That doesn't make sense to me. I agree that there may be times when people behave uh, in ways that seems like they're not really paying attention. Um, and I believe that there are some workers who are, are less inclined to understand what the rules and the procedures are but at the end of the day, I don't believe that workers really don't care what happens. And I, I don't believe that they deliberately uh, violate procedures because they just kind of want to see what happens. Todd Conklin is somebody that I've really come to appreciate over the years. And I hope if you are not familiar with his work, uh, you'll get familiar with his work. Um, and, and, you know, his position on compliance uh, and, and procedural activities is that mistakes don't equal violations. I agree with that. If a worker uh, violates a procedure, doesn't comply with a particular procedure uh, because of a mistake, an honest mistake, or because of their perception, that common sense that we were talking about, their perception of what's going on around them, then why do we consider it to be a violation that needs to be disciplined or punished as opposed to a mistake that perhaps needs to be understood. So violations and lack of compliance, um, I think it's also been a challenge for us um, with some of the things that we've been trying to implement uh, with regard to the pandemic, uh, including all of the administrative procedures and work practices that we've been trying to implement. And in the past couple of months, I've come across a couple of situations that have really kind of troubled me um, the first one was a picture that somebody posted of a, uh, a very large in-person uh, safety conference that was going on. And it was a picture of the room and the lead speaker was about to speak. And there were, I don't know, 150 people in the room. And I said to her, you know, why wasn't anybody wearing a mask? And the person who posted the picture said, well, they gave us masks in our goodie bag. And I said, okay, so why weren't people wearing them? And she said, well, you know, we were following local guidance. And I said, well, if, if their organization was requiring their workers to wear a mask, even if the local authorities, the public health departments or the state or the county uh, wasn't requiring it, what would they say to those workers if they took their mask off and didn't wear it? 
Um, in, in the picture that you see here, this is a picture of the recently held uh, ASSP conference, which was in Austin. It was a hybrid event, actually, but that's me there on the left with the holding the mask up, please sign, and that's one of the staff people there. Um, when you registered for that event, you had to agree to wear a mask inside the venue at all times. So once you stepped into the convention center, into any of the rooms where there were presentations going on, and the expo hall and, and out in the area, you said you agreed to wear a mask. And the staff were the ones who got stuck enforcing that requirement. Um, and honestly, I was very frustrated with the number of people that weren't wearing masks and the need to continue to uh, encourage people to put their masks on. Despite the fact that many of the folks were working for organizations that were requiring masks. And so again, I think to myself, if you require your employees to wear a mask and they don't, what do you do? And if you go to an event that requires you to wear a mask and you don't, what's the difference? Or, you know, the corollary is, what if a worker says, well, I'm just going to take my hard hat off for this one minute. I'm just going to put my safety glasses up on the top of my head so I can see this thing really close up. Or uh, I'm just going to unhook my uh, connector, my lanyard uh, for just a couple of seconds, right? So those are compliance issues um, that I think challenge us all the time. And I think we have to be careful when we think about compliance and why we don't get the kind of compliance that we think we need. People behave in ways that are always adapting to the situation and the system that they're working in, which of course is always changing. Uh, if you've read anything that Sidney Decker has written, particularly uh, his great book, The Field Guide uh, for Human Behavior, um, he talks a lot about how people respond to the system that they're working in. And as we look at it, our common sense says, well, that doesn't make any sense. But to the person who's in that situation, it does make a lot of sense. It's probably been done that way many times before. And depending upon how we respond to it, it's going to continue to be done uh, the same way again. So in my opinion, in, in, in the opinion of, of many folks who espouse some of these worker-based uh, approaches, deviation generally comes from lack of understanding or lack of enforcement, as opposed to deliberate lack of compliance. And I'm not going to, to, to say that no one has ever uh, uh, not complied with the procedure uh, for any other reason, that there's never been anyone who's uh, done it deliberately. But I think we're, we find it very easy as professionals, at least in, in my observation, to point to that as a problem. And then what do we do about compliance, right? Somehow we think that if somebody doesn't comply, then you know there's the discipline and those kinds of things. But, but the way to fix the problem is to write a better policy, to write a better procedure, to go back to the one that we have and tweak it or add more to it or change it around and then put it back out again and uh, work with uh, employees to train them on that procedure to somehow increase that compliance. But I think that that's a failure of understanding why people do what they do and why people behave the way they behave. And that's where I think some of our introspection about what we think about people and why they behave the way they behave is something that we need to continue to be aware of. So um, some of the problems that we've talked about, um, uh, addressing those problems or, or, or thinking about how we view workers and how we view the way they behave requires us to think a little differently. Um, it requires us to think differently about safety. And so I'm going to cover two different approaches that I mentioned at the beginning. We're going to talk a little bit about safety differently, and we're going to take a, a, talk a little bit about human and organizational performance. Um, time prohibits me from going into great detail about a lot of them, but I picked these particular two, and I noticed that um, Scott DeBow in his presentation earlier today was actually talking about um, human and organizational performance uh, in one of his slides, which I thought was really pretty cool. But if you're ready to think a little differently, let's talk about safety differently. Uh, so if you're not familiar with safety differently and what it is, um, and I put the quotes around movement, uh, or it's an approach uh, within the industry that challenges organizations to think about the people who work for the organization differently, to consider their expertise and their insights as the fundamental value that they bring to the organization. 
And um, that the fact that they uh, are uh, involved in the dignity of work, just basic work every day, day in and day out work, is really a critical appreciation that the organization has to have. I make a slight tweak on this to say that what, what I'm talking about here is um, that safety professionals have to challenge the way they view people and begin to view them differently and rely on their expertise, their insights, and the dignity of work and the value that the worker brings to the organization as opposed to the need to somehow uh, pretzel ourselves into ways to get workers to comply, uh, to use their common sense, and to behave in ways that we wouldn't characterize as stupid. So safety differently and human and organizational performance put the worker at the center uh, and, 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 and demonstrate the value of the worker to the organization. So the second one is human and organizational performance. And Hoffa is most frequently associated with Todd Conklin uh, as well as another woman by the name of Andrea Baker. And, and there are others. Um, I, I don't want to be exclusive about that. Um, and the principles kind of have varying ways of being phrased, but these are basically the five principles of human and organizational performance. So error is normal. People make mistakes. And so we have to accept that, appreciate that, and recognize that for what it is. Uh, that it is not a deliberate attempt to be uh, non-compliant. It can simply uh, be a mistake. And that error is normal and to normalize error, yet at the same time, work to minimize that error within our organization. The idea that blaming fixes nothing, that if our focus is on finding who to blame for what happened, um, that's not going to fix the problem because we still end up back in that situation where uh, if we blame the worker or the workers involved in the particular situation, then our solution becomes to fix the worker. But if we haven't learned by now that fixing the worker uh, leads to lots and lots more procedures and compliance and observations and other kinds of activities, then that's, you know, that's where, we're, where we are if we feel like we need to find the worker who was responsible for the incident. When we think about behavior and we think about the way people behave in a particular system, it's the system that drives the behavior, not the behavior that drives the system. And so when we look at a worker's behavior, instead of thinking, it, uh, thinking of it as stupid or lacking in common sense, our question then becomes, what is it about the system in which the worker is working and operating that is driving that behavior? Uh, why does the worker behave that way? The next one, learning is vital. This is one I really, really like, and I, we'll talk a little bit more about learning uh, teams and learning questions uh, towards the end of the presentation, but learning is vital, right? So how we react matters. Uh, and if we react in a way to blame or um, uh, how we behave towards workers, uh, that's really, really a, a critical component of human and organizational performance. So what does that look like then in practice, right? Let's talk about a couple of things. So a procedure violation, if we think about it from a safety differently or a hop perspective, um, we sort of have this fundamental attribution error problem associated with behavior and what we were talking about before. So everybody else's behavior is flawed, um, but not us. However, if we were in the same set of circumstances, we'd behave the same way. So for example, if uh, uh, we teach a class and uh, have a training class and Sally is late to the training class, it's because she's lazy or can't get organized or you know just doesn't have the ability to get where she needs to be on time. But if we were teaching the class and we were 20 minutes late, it's because of traffic or it's because of something beyond our control. So we see behavior differently in terms of someone else versus ourself. The second one comes from a, a person who I really appreciate, Rosa Carrillo, who talks about drift from procedure being a positive adaptation. And a lot of HOP and uh, safety differently and safety one and two look at drift and drift from procedure. And that's where we get the concepts of work is imagined versus work is done. So the procedure is how we imagine work would be and work is done is the way it actually gets done. Sometimes those adaptations are very positive. It allows the work to be done. But when we see that drift from procedure is our first inclination to punish it uh, rather than celebrate it, right? 
So common sense means we have different perspectives and experiences. And so we should celebrate that. We should be willing to accept that uh, our workers and our workforce is going to approach a problem from different perspectives, and we should encourage it. That's how innovation occurs. That's the way better mousetraps have been built over the years. And so organizations have to be uh, uh, willing to do that. But as the theme of our presentation, you have to be willing to encourage that as well. And so in your practice and in the way you interact with workers, do you do that? When we have a failure of a system or a process or we, when we have an incident that either results in property damage or injury or maybe almost does, you know, how do we respond to those? Well, a lot of the theories behind HOP and some of these other emerging approaches is that incidents are truly normal variability of work. Um, fatalities and serious injuries, while they're, they're very detrimental to the organization and to the people who are involved in them, they are statistical anomalies. They, they don't happen that often. And so our focus needs to be on understanding normal work. In other words, when things go right, because 99 point something percent of the time, the task that we're performing goes right. And every once in a while, it doesn't go right. But if we focus on learning how it goes right and building resilience into that, that reduces that error potential for when things don't go right. I've also come to appreciate that there is no one root cause to an incident. And so that drive by incident investigations to try to find the one thing that happened that caused it, that if we can fix that, it won't ever happen again and we can walk away. I don't believe that that's true. Incidents are multi-causal events. And in our search to find that one root cause, I think we fail to appreciate the multi-causal event because we keep thinking that we can fix that root cause, that one last thing. You know, the reality is that good processes sometimes produce bad outcomes and bad processes sometimes produce good outcomes. But focusing on the worker and the work that they're doing allows us as professionals to be a little bit more engaged with the worker and appreciate the systems and the, the kinds of things that they work with and deal with every day. So the last little bit of time that I wanna spend here together is to talk now more about how I'm leading safety differently and what I've learned and what I'm doing to change and, and I'm, are changing. This is not a, I'm done now, okay, move on. This is a process, this is a journey. Uh, and, and maybe in some of these things that I'm doing, you'll find some nuggets that make sense to you, that resonate with you, that, that you can apply. So uh, Rosa Carrillo, who I mentioned earlier, uh, says that workers will speak up when they feel it's safe to do so. And that kind of ties into a lot of the concepts around psychological safety that we keep hearing about, that, that workplaces where there is a lot of psychological safety, people are willing to speak up. They are willing to talk about things that concern them. But at the end of the day, if I'm leading safety differently, I believe it's my responsibility to make the workplace so that workers do feel safe to speak up, that I have to accept some responsibility for the situation as it is, if it's a situation where workers don't feel safe speaking up, then I need to take some responsibility for why that is and change the way I act and react in order to change the scenario. So back to those hop principles, that fifth principle of how we react matters. And that's what I believe, how I react matters. And so it's caused me to take a whole different view of an approach to interacting with workers uh, in workplaces. Um, I, I really uh, have learned to appreciate the basic dignity of the job that they do, that I care about them, that they value their work. And I'll tell you, if, if we as safety professionals can't learn to appreciate the value of the dignity of work that's been done by our workplace, in our workplaces in the past uh, almost two years of this pandemic, I don't know what else is going to demonstrate that for us. People have gotten up and come into work day after day after day, despite amazingly challenging circumstances, uh, a, a raging pandemic, uh, people getting sick, all kinds of things that they've had to deal with. Um, and that's a true testament to the dignity and the value that the workers bring to our organizations. So it's on me as a leader in, in an organization, as a safety leader, to identify 
uh, that broken trust that I think has uh, occurs sometimes in organizations between workers and how the organization views them and take that lead in mending those uh, broken trust and uh, identifying my own role or my own beliefs that may have helped create that broken trust. You know, I might like to think to myself, well, I don't think workers are stupid and I don't think that they lack common sense, but, but I also have to think about sort of checking my attitude and the way I interact uh, because even though I may not say that out loud, uh, perhaps there are ways in which I embody that in the way I behave. And um, one of the things that somebody shared with me once that I found to be really, really helpful, um, we were doing a, a walk around on a particular site and um, I was engaging with a couple of the workers and, you know, we got back to the conference room and we were sitting down and kind of sharing. And, and this person who I was working with took me aside privately and said, you know, would you be up to hearing something that I saw out there uh, that I'd like to share with you? I said, sure, sure. And, and this person said to me, um, I noticed that uh, every time you were engaging in a conversation with workers, you had a sort of a very closed stance. Your arms were crossed in front of you. Um, you know, you had your little clipboard out and you were writing things down. And it, it seemed to me, this person said, that if I were the worker and I was sort of standing across from you and watching you write all kinds of things down, I would think to myself, she's not really listening to me. Um, and she's angry at me for some reason or frustrated with me for some reason. And so um, that person really kind of clued me into some subtle things that I might have been doing that I wasn't aware of. So I believe that the problems that we have in our organizations and how we engage uh, with workers uh, can be solved through that engagement. And in order to engage with them, we need to engage in conversations, uh, two-way conversations, uh, and conversations that make sure that we are communicating, that we are interested in the responses that we're getting, that we're truly curious to hear what workers think and are truly interested in engaging with them, as opposed to functioning in a uh, leader role, a, a role above them, uh, telling them what to do. That sort of child adult role that I think sometimes we get in when we are engaging with workers. Uh, this is how you need to do this. This is the role that you're going to play. This is the procedure. This is what we have to do. Uh, and I prefer to think about getting in an engagement, sort of a one-on-one, -on -one uh, in the same space, at the same uh, level. Uh, this is Teddy Roosevelt. If you don't know what Teddy Roosevelt looks like, uh, that's him. And he's credited with uh, this particular phrase that you see on the slide right now. And this is something, again, that just really resonated with me with the first time I heard it a number of years ago. You know, we as safety professionals can sometimes get really, really wrapped up in our technical expertise and what we know about the OSHA regulations or about the way a particular process is supposed to work and, and all that technical information about safety that we've spent many, many years learning. And, and it's a very, very important part of our job. But it doesn't really matter how much you know what your technical expertise is until people know that you care about them. And, and again, I think this applies to our personal lives, but in terms of the context that we're talking about, people will uh, be more willing to engage with you and share with you if they have a basic understanding that you care about them, you care about the work that they're doing, you really want to help them. Then and only then will you begin to get some appreciation for that technical information that you can provide. And again, I think about... Um, um, when I first started out in safety many, many years ago, very young person, and I found myself in front of a group of uh, gentlemen in a steel mill. And these were workers who were part of a uh, maintenance crew. And um, they'd been in the positions that they were in for, I don't know, 20 years, 20-ish years, maybe more. And here I was maybe a year out of, out of undergrad and I was supposed to stand up in front of the room and conduct a training class. And I just remember looking around the room and, and thinking to myself, this is, this is really scary. I mean, these folks know their jobs. And so the way I was able to engage with them 
Um, and, and you know, you sort of saw that idea that what are you going to tell me that I don't already know? But the way I was able to successfully engage with them was to communicate to them that I cared about how they did their job. I cared about whether or not they were safe and that my goal was to try to work with them as a partner rather than as a teacher and student, that sort of adult child kind of role. And let's work together to see how we can address the kinds of things that you do. Um, and it resonated with most of them. And, and it's a process, it's a stance that I've taken uh, ever since when I do training. Uh, I, I don't try to uh, tell uh, a millwright that I know how to be a millwright. Um, I don't try to tell them uh, how to do their job. I try to partner with them in doing their job. So we're talking here about having relationships, personal relationships with the people that you work with. And again, I'm gonna stop for just a few seconds to let you uh, read through. And this is something that my friend Rosa Carilla says. So when we talk about personal work relationships, we're not talking about uh, sort of personal friendships, the kinds of uh, relationships that you might have with your friends, your family. But the personal is that we take the time to get to know people as individuals. Um, and so we build a relationship with them based upon getting to know them and showing that we value them and value the work and what they bring uh, to the particular job and task. And that sense of, as Rosa says, belonging and inclusion does a couple of things. First of all, it sets the expectation that everybody treats each other the same way, but it also sets the expectation that what you say matters, what you think matters, <coughs> excuse me, and that I value your perspective. I value your insight. I value your expertise. Not just that I'm going to tell you how to do this, but we're going to work together. And I, I want you to bring that uh, to this relationship. And so I wanted to just kind of take a minute to kind of point out that these relationships that we're talking about developing with workers, they're not quite the same. They're personal, but they're not friendships per se. This is the part about the learning questions that I mentioned earlier that I wanted to talk about a little bit today. Um, and you know, Stephen Covey in his book, um, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, one of the things he talks about is how people don't listen with the intent to understand, they in listen with the intent to reply. And I have to tell you, that's me, uh, it, it was me, um, and it sometimes still is. Uh, I'm a work in progress in this area. I, I always used to find myself ready to respond the minute you stop talking. And sometimes I didn't even wait till you stop talking. So um, I've had to really teach myself and catch myself and be alert to that and really focus on listening with the intent to understand. And that's what we're talking about in terms of those conversations with workers that allow them to share and bring their expertise to the table. So that was me and it still sometimes is, and maybe it's you as well. So how this applies is with this concept of what we call learning questions, um, where we're asking questions to learn and understand and not to reply. And it's part of a sort of a broader perspective of leading differently that focuses on that sort of willingness and appreciation for being curious and learning um, how I can be helpful and learning how people do the work that they do and learning about their unique perspectives and their unique experiences. And so when I walk around a floor doing a site walk or an audit, I really change the kinds of things that I say when I'm talking to workers and I'm trying to engage them in some information. I'm trying to be curious and I'm trying to make sure that the questions that I ask demonstrate that I'm interested in understanding and not replying. So here's a list of some learning questions. And again, I put some names down at the bottom of this particular slide. And, and these are some folks that I've learned a lot from in terms of learning questions and uh, what that looks like and where those come from. So these are the kinds of questions that I now find myself asking uh, when I walk around a site doing an audit or, or a site walk or something like that that I might be doing. Because I'm really looking to find out from the people who are performing the job, the people at that sharp end of the stick that we talk about, uh, what that means and how that works. Now, what's the process that's predictable and unpredictable? What can they tell me about it? 
How can I partner with them to help make that process more predictable? What's the worst thing that can happen? And then the follow-up question is, uh, what can we do to keep that worst thing from happening? Uh, why is it hard to get things done or how hard is it to get done? What kind of mistakes in this process are easy to make? I, I always like the next to the last one. How would you manage this job if your child were doing the work? What would you do differently if your child were doing the work? And bringing it down to a level that is really basic and functional. And how do we do this so that if something goes wrong, no one gets hurt? Uh, that's a concept of uh, failing safely that Todd Conklin talks about a lot in some of his writings. Um, because failure is normal, it's normal variability of an organization. So building in that resilience uh, comes from the answers that we get to that particular question. So these are really good learning questions for you to think about as you engage with workers, whether you're doing a walk around or whether you're sitting down at the table doing some training or some other type of a safety brief or a safety meeting those are the kinds of questions that you might want to think about asking uh, uh, in, in different ways, because these are the kinds of questions that uh, draw out the kind of information that you need so that you can lead safety uh, a, a little bit differently. So um, sort of as I begin to get ready to close up here, um, you know, you, you really need to check yourself, right? Um, workers aren't stupid. They're not idiots. They don't lack common sense. Uh, they're human beings, they have value, and they deserve to be treated with dignity. And I know that many of us believe that and act that way, uh, but I just sort of added that little caveat there uh, in terms of how we treat them in person and how we treat them behind their backs. So on those LinkedIn posts that we comment on or laugh about, um, just make sure that you're checking yourself. So if you're ready to lead differently, the first thing that I think we all have to do uh, as safety professionals is really just to get back down to the concept of uh, the value and dignity of the people that we work for. And, and the workers are the ones that we work for every bit as much as we work for an organization. So how can you lead differently just to kind of summarize some of the things that we've talked about? So again, be willing to consider that the way you think uh, might be part of the problem. Uh, the way you act um, your attitudes and the things that you uh, think uh, in your head, but maybe don't say out loud, that quiet part that you say to yourself, uh, that might be part of the problem. Uh, make sure that you are communicating that you care and that you value your workers' humanity and their dignity. And that really requires a different approach for some people who may not be used to sort of a softer approach, an approach that's more based upon uh, developing relationships with workers um, and, and seeing them as uh, fellow human beings. Making sure that you're listening uh, with the intent to understand uh, rather than with the intent to reply. That when you ask a question, that you're, uh, you're asking that question because you want to hear the information. Uh, and again, those learning questions that are available. And the last thing that I have on there is, again, a quote from my friend Rosa Carrillo, who talks about inclusion in solutioning precedes accountability for the outcome, right? So if workers are the solution, then we have to include them in that how we solve different problems. If we want them to be accountable for the outcome, if we want them to be engaged in the outcome, if we want the frustrations of trying to get workers to comply, if we kind of want that to go away, uh, then including them in the solutions uh, can help proceed that accountability for the outcome. So how about a little quiz? Everybody ready for a little quiz? Now, you don't have to share your answers with anybody on this one, and you don't have to uh, um, uh, get a grade at the end of this, but, but I'm just gonna throw out a, a few questions here at the end uh, to see what you think uh, about some of these things. So the first one, uh, true or false, being a good safety manager is about controlling whether workers make mistakes. This is something that uh, Andrea Baker says. Uh, and again, being a good safety manager or a good safety leader isn't anything about control and it isn't about whether workers make mistakes or not. Um, being a good safety manager uh, is about relinquishing that control and appreciating that mistakes are normal, error is normal. 
people make mistakes um, and that they are not violations. They are not things that deserve some sort of discipline or uh, punishment. This is the one I mentioned earlier. So true or false, workers will speak up to stop an unsafe act if it's in their best interest to do so. There's a lot of really interesting studies out there about why people don't stop someone from doing something where they might get hurt. You know, why do they walk past someone uh, behaving in an unsafe way? Why don't they say to their colleague, uh, Joe, you, you know, you got to tie off. Why aren't you tied off? Or uh, what causes that to happen? And again, Rosa believes, and I agree, that workers will speak up if, if it's in their best interest to do so. So part of our responsibility is creating a climate, creating an environment where they want to speak up, they want to share their ideas, they want to share their concerns. Uh, and that psychologically safe workplace creates the environment where workers will speak up uh, if they see an unsafe actor, if they have a question or if they have a concern. This one I, I really uh, I appreciate. Workers don't cause failures. They trigger latent conditions that lie dormant in an organization. It's not who failed, it's what failed. So back to human and organizational performance. It's the system that drives the behavior. It's the system that fails, not the worker that fails. Workers are just responding and reacting uh, to the situations and the environment around them, the conditions around them. They're working and they're acting and they're doing a variety of different kinds of things. And it's that alignment of factors that cause those failures. So as, as many people will say, you know, an incident or a lack of an incident can be uh, as much luck as anything else. Another one of my favorite Todd Conklin isms um, uh, an event was caused by human error uh, because they didn't follow procedure. It's true. It's always true. Um, uh, it, it, every time I, I look at investigations of different kinds of incidents, you can almost always find some human uh, piece of that incident causality, that somebody did something they weren't supposed to do or didn't do something they were supposed to do. But that's always true, but that's not going to help us if we really truly want to learn uh, as an organization uh, to develop and grow and build resilience uh, into our operations. Uh, and the last one I'll leave you with is something that I, I, I really firmly believe. Uh, safety is not the presence of accidents, it's the presence of absence of accidents, excuse me. It's the presence of capacity. There's a lot of talk out there now about um, incident rates and lagging incident rates and what they mean or don't mean. And I firmly and truly believe uh, that if you if you think that your low TRIR is an indication that work is being done safely in your organization, um, I, I think you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, the absence of accidents doesn't mean that we have a safe workplace. Building capacity into the organization, building capacity and resilience into the workers who we rely on in the organization is what does that. And we as safety leaders in our organizations have a significant role to play in building up that presence of capacity in recognizing workers for the value that they bring and finding ways to enhance that and to celebrate that and to bring that into our organization. So I've had an aha moment, as I said at the very beginning uh, of my presentation, uh, I had an aha moment. Uh, it wasn't actually one aha moment. There were a number of different aha moments uh, that have really kind of led me to the way I view my role as a safety leader and what I think I'm responsible to do and how I can do things differently than what I've done before. Uh, so I've sort of tried to take you through the journey that I went through and the things that I've discovered and the things that I believe. Um, maybe your journey will be different. Uh, maybe you uh, will think that most of what I've said really doesn't respond, relate to you and, and, and you won't find that helpful. But um, I, I believe that we all have ways in which we can improve and change uh, in how we practice safety. So I do want to thank you very much for listening today. And I want to close kind of quickly here uh, and open up for um, just general conversation. Uh, these are some people who have influenced me and, and all of these names have come out in the conversation that we've had so far. So Todd Conklin, uh, he has, if you're a podcast person, his pre-accident investigations podcast is really, really, really good. Um, he has a bunch of different books out, but 
uh, his uh, main one that I like is pre-accident investigations. He also participates pretty regularly on a website called Hop Hub, Human and Organizational Performance Hub. Uh, it's a good place to see some of the things that he has to say. Sydney Decker, of course, uh, a real legend in our field uh, and, and in sort of helping us to learn to think differently about safety. Um, and the Field Guide to Understanding Human Behavior uh, was a really, really critical book in my journey and in my transformation. If you've not read it, I highly recommend you do. It will change how you view and lead uh, incident investigations and will change how you uh, do that and what you call them. Uh, Rosa Carrillo, uh, excellent, excellent person. She focuses a lot on relationships and the relationships between us and workers and in how that enhances our role as a safety leader. Uh, an excellent book, probably one of the best books that I've read in the past five years uh, that's really, really had an impact on me. Uh, Andrea Baker talks a lot about hot fundamentals and learning questions. She also posts regularly on uh, Hop Hub. Uh, safetydifferently.com is a website that you can go to. There is also a Safety Differently group on LinkedIn. Uh, it's not as active uh, as it used to be, um, uh, but safetydifferently.com is really good. And then last, uh, a friend of mine uh, by the name of Jeff Dalto, uh, he works for uh, Convergence Safety Vector Solutions. Uh, he wrote a, um, a, a, um, a manual uh, on a guide to practicing new safety. And he uh, conducted interviews with about 90 of us. Um, and he asked us all the same questions. And then he put that all together in a book. And he offers that to anyone for free. Um, you have to reach out to him directly uh, to his email, which is there, uh, and ask him to send you a copy of a guide to practicing new safety. And he will be happy to do that. And it'll give you the opportunity to read. And one of the nice things about that particular guide is that it has a lot of additional resources. One of the questions he asked all of us was, you know, what would you say to somebody? Where would you tell them to look if they wanted to learn more about some of this new safety stuff? And everybody had a lot of great references uh, for that. So that brings me to the end of uh, what I wanted to say today. I hope uh, some of the things that I've said resonated with you, uh, made you think, uh, make you wanna do things differently moving forward. Well, before we start the q and I want to let everyone know about an evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. The survey will open in a different screen after this webinar. Your input will help us to improve our future webcasts. Although this is a pre-recorded event, any questions you'd like to submit at this time will be forwarded along to our speaker. Uh, to take us through today's recorded Q&A with Pam is Aveta Senior Marketing Specialist, Samantha Focarino. So let's start with this one. What should my response be when I come across some of those images and videos posted on social media that show workers performing unsafe acts and the mm -hmm. responses? Yeah, I struggle with this because I have to really, I have to like pull my hands back, put them under my legs because I just want to type something really, really fast because I just have this really, you know, this knee jerk reaction that I just want to say something uh, but I think, um, I, I do think that saying nothing is part of the problem. And I've decided, uh, I took this stance about a year ago, that when I see those kinds of things, I actually do go in and say something. I, I've learned to craft my responses in a non-confrontational way, but at the same time, um, I, I make a point that I think it doesn't help anyone uh, to, to, to share these kinds of things. If we want to use them for learning, that's one thing. But if we want to use them to make fun of people, I think that that does ourselves as a profession uh, a disservice. And I, I try to focus on the profession rather than on the post person that posted it. I do get some pushback sometimes. And I, you know, I do try to stay with the message that I think we all have to uh, challenge ourselves to be better with these kinds of things. Um, and so I would encourage you to do that too. Um, you don't have to be confrontational, but you can make a point. Awesome. All right. Um, was there one event or experience that triggered this look into how you were acting and reacting that may have been contributing to the responses you were getting from workers? Yeah, there was one that really you know, I was starting to read a lot about some of these emerging 
approaches and I was really starting to appreciate them. And, you know, I would read them and I would think, you know, that really makes a lot of sense. Um, but, but one day I was, um, I, I was on, on LinkedIn and no, no, not LinkedIn, excuse me. I was on a, a professional Facebook group, although professional Facebook sometimes is a little bit of a, um, uh, disconcerting way to put those two terms. together but be that as it may um and and a person was making some comments about workers and and the way they behave and compliance and you know it was really kind of expressing a lot of frustration and i went to that person's profile and they had a, a professional profile and they were a, a consultant they were an occupational safety and health consultant and they uh, um they had their logo on their Facebook page and um, uh, the name of the company was on there. And at the very bottom of the logo, it said, uh, because you can't fix stupid. And I was so shocked by that, that, that someone would actually put that on their logo of their company in a way to appeal to organizations that I can come in and I can, you know, I can take care of things because, you know, we can't fix stupid. It just really, really it made me sit back on my heels and I thought to myself, um, that's really part of the problem. And um, it, it isn't just that our, we have a responsibility as professionals to lead our organizations uh, to uh, for continuous improvement and all those good things. It's that I think we have a responsibility as safety professionals to be aware of ourselves and what we think and our attitudes and how we interact with workers and catch ourselves uh, when we are falling into those you can't fix stupid moments. And, and I think we've all had them. We're only human. But I think we have to be willing to be aware of them and pay attention to them. Uh, as a way to sort of move ourselves forward and lead safety differently. And, you know, I always think about the definition of insanity, right? Uh, insanity is doing the same thing you've always done and hoping for different results. Um, and so I think that's kind of my message. If, if you're not happy with the results that you're getting in your organization or in your interactions with your workers in your organization, then, you know, again, maybe it's not the organization, maybe it's not the worker, maybe it's you. And if it is, be willing to make some changes. I love that. That's such a great point. Uh, we had a question come through about what should one respond when somebody requests for a service or PPE that's not a part of company policy? Um, I think that that is a great opportunity to have one of those engagement conversations uh, where you can practice a lot of your learning questions to really just sit down with that worker on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with an intent to understand what they're looking for and why. And really beginning to find a way to get at the, the reason behind the request and determining, uh, you may go one way or the other with this. You may say to yourself, you know, this person's right and it makes sense and Maybe we need to change our procedure because this person is really bringing some important information to the table that we have not yet considered, <coughs> excuse me. Or the other way you may go is that when you really find out what the worker's looking for, what they're really asking for, that you could engage in that relationship with them to problem solve or to solution that problem together. And maybe the solution isn't uh, some PPE that's against policy, but maybe there are other solutions that you can find. But until you really understand the reason for the question, until you really understand the re reason for the request, uh, it's hard for you to know how to respond to it. And that really requires you to sit and listen and understand. Well, we thank you all for attending today's presentation. We hope you take the time to share your feedback via our survey. I'd like to spend a send a special thank you today to our presenter, Pam Woloski, and everyone from our sponsor, Adaveta. This ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. Take care, everyone, and have a safe day.